to be here this afternoon. First, I'd like to uh, thank SBE for the opportunity to share some of our work with you all today. Um, during this period of the pandemic, we've all uh, had our challenges with trying to transmit our messages and, and sharing uh, our data and information in meetings. And so this is a very nice uh, opportunity to be able to share with you all some of our uh, approaches to research in immunology and immunoregulation of human diseases. And uh, as my talk today says, I'll be focusing on uh, the area of high dimensional flow cytometry and how we use that as a tool for studying immunoregulation, immunopathology and human diseases. Many of you um, are certainly familiar with flow cytometry and others less so in some of the applications which we'll be talking about today and I've been using uh, may be new. So of course, we'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation. And uh, please let me know uh, any questions you have. And as soon as the presentation uh, is over, we'll address as many of those questions as we can. The, the uh, so I'm going to now share the, so we have two different transmission methods going on. Uh, one is via uh, the Facebook site of uh, SBE, the Brazilian Society for Immunology. And the other is via uh, Instagram, which apparently doesn't allow for sharing the slides. So on the Instagram, I guess you'll just see me talking. Uh, and on the Facebook site, you'll be able to see the slides and hear me talking. So I do recommend the, the, the Facebook Live if you can't see the slides uh, via Instagram. Okay, um, so thanks again. My name is Ken Golub. Uh, I'm the head of the Transmational Translational Immuno-Oncology Group at uh, Asakamargo Cancer Center. Uh, Asakamargo is an integrated diagnostic treatment uh, research and education center for combating cancer. Uh, it's located in Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, it treats all areas of, of cancer. Uh, and um, the research center is in a building uh, next to the hospital where the basic and applied research facilities are. And there's also, of course, uh, clinical research uh, capabilities and capacities set up over at the uh, hospital itself. So the translational immuno-oncology group uh, was established in September of 2018. And today we count on a, a nice flow cytometry center that was uh, uh, installed via an innovation project at Asakamargo. When I joined Asakamargo in late 2017, they had a, uh, uh, a calling for innovation projects and I submitted one based on setting up this flow cytometry center. It was approved and led to the acquisition of the FACT Symphony A5 which is a 30 parameter, 28 color flow cytometer and also fax area fusion uh, cell sorter. In addition, in the main lab, we have a Bioplex 220, which we use for multiplex cytokine, chemokine uh, growth factor analysis. And we have a tissue culture area and an area for uh, studies uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, computational work. And so this is the group today. Uh, this is, uh, it's a couple of different pictures because different people were around for the two different uh, opportunities. And uh, we're made up of uh, undergraduate students, master's students, PhD students, postdocs, scientists, technicians, nurses. We have clinical nurse as well that uh, is critical for uh, lining up all the patients and getting all the uh, sample collections done. And today, um, this is the, the image of, of uh, the, the group. So overall, our, uh, our research is kind of uh, broken into three main categories. The first line of, of research uh, run by myself is in the area of immunoregulation and immune networks. And uh, in my case, I focus on 
uh, immune regulation tolerance uh, networks in cancer, looking for markers of response to therapy and adverse events in, in patients treated with checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, also identifying novel targets for increasing response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. We have a head and neck uh, cancer project uh, looking at response to therapy, triple negative breast cancer, immune networks in transplant patients with leukemia and, uh, and respiratory infections, and immune regulation and microbiome and cervical cancer, which is a project in collaboration with the Institute of Mariapana in Belo de Sanche, uh, which is where I uh, was before I relocated to Sao Paulo. And that's also in collaboration with Georgia Trinquieri at the NIH. Uh, Thiago Medina joined the group uh, about a year and a half ago, and he's a specialist in epigenetic regulation of immune populations. Uh, he uh, recently was awarded a Jovem Pesquisador Tapespi project, and he's uh, fo focusing on landscape of epigenetic landscape and tumors, and also tertiary lymphoid uh, structures in, in, uh, in cancer. Also uh, looking at immunotherapy and targets in let me turn my paint my pointer on here. Uh, identification of immunotherapy uh, targets. And Vladimir Lima is a clinical uh, oncologist who spends part of his time in the lab uh, and the rest in the clinic. And he is uh, focusing his research in the area of inflammation and cancer biomarkers and uh, working in melanoma and, and lung cancer, uh, lymph node dendritic cells and triple negative breast cancer, and also some Hodgkin's lymph studies. So today I'm going to focus on um, some, some aspects of the uh, immunoregulatory capacities um, and, and networks in, in cancer in patients treated with immune checkpoints. So we'll discuss a bit about the immune response in cancer, why that's important to study, and what are some of the big uh, uh, changes that have happened in recent years. Then I'll speak about high dimensional flow cytometry an approach that we use for deciphering these complex immunoregulatory networks. And then we'll, we'll move on to see some data on immune checkpoints in melanoma and uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, focusing on response to therapy and non-small cell lung cancer and adverse events in a cohort of patients with both uh, non-small cell lung cancer and other patients with melanoma. So why we study the, the immune response uh, in cancer, there's really two main broad categories we can think of. First of all, uh, one is the induction of a cancerous cell, and the other is what happens after we have the formation of a cancer or a tumor. So as you all know, there are many different factors that can lead to the induction of a cancer, ranging from genetic susceptibility to alterations in DNA through mutations. These are often environmental bomb bombardment, either by tobacco, radiation, chemicals. And we also have infections that can induce cancers. And the most uh, classic and clear cut uh, example is HPV and cervical cancer. Uh, and there are also other strong associations between infections and gastric cancer, for example, in the case of uh, H. pylori. Now, the immune response also plays a role in the development of cancer cells both in a positive sense in that uh, an inflammatory background can lead to a higher increase in certain types of cancer through damage to uh, DNA, and also in a preventive sense where that same inflammatory response may also help in combat cancers once they start. So I focus my research on the right-hand side of this slide where once we have the formation of a cancer cell, um, two different things can happen. We can have an activated immune response that recognizes that cancer cell as something different, eliminates it, and maintains the homeostasis of the tissue. So this is what we all hope happens in any case where we have development of a cancer cell. And we often may not even know that even happened, right? Because this cell has become altered due to any one of these different mechanisms. It loses its uh, controls over cell proliferation and sometimes spatial uh, control as well. And if that cell is recognized in a vigorous way by T cells, CD8 T cells, CD4 T cells, innate cells like macrophages, dendritic cells, and even antibodies, uh, that cancer cell could be eliminated and maintain this homeostasis, maintaining the health of the individual. However, when that immune response is ineffective at recognizing the tumor or the cancer cells, we then get outgrowth of a tumor and the patient arrives at the hospital with cancer. 
Now, there are many different reasons you can have an ineffective immune response. Those can range from immune uh, focus, which is inactivation of T cells, suppressor T cells can suppress the immune response, suppressor myeloid cells, epigenetic programming, and the tumor itself also escapes, can escape the immune response by modulation of different molecules, ranging from suppressive molecules to inactivated T cell to turning off things like MHC class one so that it becomes invisible to a, different, to a specific group of CDA positive T cells. Regardless of the mechanism, the tumor grows and leads to a cancer. So this is where we do our research is when a patient comes to the hospital already with a cancer developed and they'll enter into many different treatment regimes depending on the clinical characteristics of their particular cancer. So once the oncologist has determined that this is a good candidate for an immune checkpoint inhibitor, this is where immunotherapy enters, where you try to reinvigorate this immune response. So remember the immune response started trying to re react against these cells, it can be inhibited, and then you can try and reinvigorate or reactivate uh, that cellular response. So immune checkpoint inhibitors, we'll talk more about them, uh, act to reinvigorate. We also have adoptive cell therapy and CAR-T uh, responses with Marcin from uh, Inca spoke about that in one of these uh, SBEBD seminars uh, not too long ago. Um, and there are many other types of immunotherapy available. We'll be focusing on checkpoint inhibitors, as I mentioned. Uh, and then we want to understand more about how those act to reactivate the immune response. And in people where they don't work, why don't they work? And in people who develop uh, severe adverse events, autoimmune diseases, we want to understand why that happens as well. So this is a little more detail on what I just discussed about, but more now I'm down at a molecular level, level where we have the beginnings of a tumor and an immune response. And you can see here in this case, the tumor's being uh, uh, eliminated by an activated cytolytic cell, CD8 positive T cells recognizing MHC class one plus a peptide and K cells recognizing other cells that have turned off class one. We also have activated inflammatory dendritic cells producing inflammatory cytokines and cytokines that will drive a Th1 type response. That Th1 type CD4 positive T cell response then acts to produce interferon gamma, TNF alpha, IL-2, and other cytokines that will perpetuate the activation of more CD8 cytolytic cells and more NK cells. So we create a cycle of a strong inflammatory response capable of eliminating this tumor. Now, when you have establishment of an inhibitory response, this is now on the right-hand side, you can see that now we have many different factors acting to suppress the CTL and allow outgrowth of the tumor. And this can range again from the tumor cell itself expressing molecules like PDL1 that then bind to PD1 on T cells and inhibit those cells. We also have expression of CTLA4, which can bind to CD28 on T cells and inhibit them. Uh, in, uh, inhibitory tumor associated macrophages that produce IL-10, TGF beta and other molecules that act to inhibit responses as well as inhibitory dendritic cells and Treg cells. So this all um, can create an inhibitory environment allowing outgrowth of the tumor. So the key then to immune checkpoints inhibitors is try to take this environment and drive it back here to this environment over here. As you all know, um, in, in 2018, Jim Allison and Hanjo were awarded the Nobel Prize for the development of the work on checkpoint inhibitors. Jim Allison's classic work on CTLA-4, uh, when, he, when he was at Berkeley, California, at the same time I was in California at DNAX Research Institute, working on TH1, TH2 development with Bob Kaufman. And I remember well uh, Jim Allison's work uh, coming out at that time and the excitement around his potential to lead to a cancer treatment shortly after. And after around 20 years, uh, it actually made it into phase three trials. And as we know today, it's uh, brought in a whole new era of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors for treatment of cancer. In addition, uh, anti-PD-1, which again is from Hanjo's group. And this molecule is a, another critical way that's being used to reactivate the immune response. So a little bit more about how these work. Um, in the case of CTL4, these are molecules, CTLA4 and PD-1, are both molecules that are important for 
the, the normal regulation of an activated immune response. It's very important for us to regulate immune responses. As you know, we have clonal expansion once we have activation of a specific T cell. And that clonal expansion leads to rapid proliferation and expansion of clones. If we don't have a immediate method for down modulating those responses, you would have lots of problems with autoimmunity and domination of our immune response by individual clones. So CTLA-4 is turned on in CD4 and CD8 T cells when you have activation. Uh, once you have expression of CTLA-4, then it binds to either CD80 or CD86, competes for the binding of CD28, which is a positive co-stimulatory molecule, and sends a negative signal to that T cell. So CTLA-4 expressed leads to a negative signal, turning down the proliferation and activation. And in the case of PD-1, it's a similar system where you have expression of PD-1 upon activation of a T cell. Once PD-1 is expressed, it can bind to its ligands PDL1 and PDL2, and this will send a negative signal to that T cell also, uh, making it so that it will either die or proliferate less. So both of these inhibitory mechanisms are established in natural homeostasis. And in the case of cancer, it's when we have a shift of this balance that we need to revert. So this is now um, wanting to give an overall uh, view then of this balance between uh, an elimination and an activated immune response where we have a strong inflammatory response associated with interferon gamma, CD8 positive infiltrating T cells and uh, cytolytic cells, CD4, TH1 cells, M1 macrophages. And then other on, on the other extreme, when we have escape of a tumor, we have establishment of this suppressive uh, microenvironment, which is characterized by IL-10, exhausted cells, Treg cells, M2 macrophages. Now the degree to which each of these different cell populations and many other mechanisms are involved in inhibiting a response varies depending on the patient, depending on the cancer type and the stage of the cancer. So a lot of our research is focused in understanding and deciphering when certain factors are more important for leading to escape and even resistance to one of these immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we use the checkpoint inhibitors then to try and take this response and drive it back over here. It doesn't work in everybody. When it does work well, it works extremely well. And so there's always a subgroup of patients that respond very well with a complete response. There's others that respond partially and there are others that don't respond at all. And that's really where we focus most of our research. We wanna be able to understand how we can identify these cells, how we can uh, predict who will respond or who won't, and how maybe we can take advantage of this information to even increase the reach of these therapies to other types of cancers. So the main problem I'm gonna talk about today is around uh, understanding which patients will benefit most from immune checkpoint inhibitors. So the problem that I just mentioned is that not all patients respond to immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors and some develop very severe autoimmune reactions. So our solution to this is really to identify the immune molecules and cells related to therapy response or to this development of autoimmunity, which we call adverse events. Now, a key aspect of this, and it's very important for Brazil, it's really important globally, but particularly for Brazil, is to help reduce cost to the system. So currently, immune checkpoint inhibitors are available to most patients who qualify via private health insurance uh, systems, and the public health system uh, is currently not able to offer that to all patients. If we are able to identify markers that can say, no, this patient is going to respond very well, is likely to respond well, and is, like, and is unlikely to have an adverse event, you could really bring the cost down heavily because then you would be targeting this treatment for those patients that would most benefit. Um, so that is to say, if we can identify markers that will say, that will predict which patient will respond better and which patient is least likely to have adverse events, we could target therapy to those individuals, thereby saving starting out a treatment that's not going to work and also reducing uh, the cost to the overall system and hopefully increasing access uh, to more people. So through a combination really of our uh, quality clinical data and clinical expertise that we have at the Cancer Center, uh, our scientific know-how and capabilities and the patient volunteers, this combination of being at a cancer center where we have all these components in the same uh, uh, structure, will allow us to discover these immune mechanisms behind therapy failure and development of autoimmunity. 
And again, we are interested in both biomarkers and identifying novel therapies. So as you saw, there's many different cell types, many different components involved in immune regulatory networks. And so one of the most powerful tools that we can use in human disease to study these are multi-parameter flow cytometry. So multi-parameter flow cytometry allows us to analyze hundreds of thousands of cells or even millions of cells at the single cell level using cells in flow where we can mark many different cell types. As you remember in that earlier diagram, we can have CD4 positive T cells, CD8 cells, B cells, granulocytes, monocytes, many different cell types involved in immune response. And we need to know many different characteristics of these different cell types, whether they're activated inflammatory cells or whether they're inhibitory phenotype. And if they're exhausted, are they terminally exhausted? So there's a couple of different classes of exhausted cells, ones that are terminally uh, exhausted where you cannot recover them and others that can be recovered and reinvigorated. So there are many different markers we can use to study that and even new markers to be discovered uh, still. So you stain these cells with fluorescent uh, uh, compounds, either conjugated to antibodies or uh, the fluorescent compound itself. And you put these cells in flow. So here's a, a tube with the cells in PBS or saline. Those cells will run in a single, single file through the intercept with one or more lasers. When the laser hits these cells, they'll then fluoresce. And that information along with their size and their complexity will be captured by all these different detectors. And you can go detecting then each different fluorescent marker that you know is assigned to a given um, to a given marker. So, in many uh, flow cytometers that you are familiar with, you can have three colors, four colors, eight colors, fifteen colors. In the case of the Fact Symphony uh, A5, we have a twenty-eight color machine with five different lasers. And that creates a really powerful situation, but also some complexities that have to be dealt with, which is really what I want to focus uh, the next few slides explaining. Um, but just basically, uh, again, for, for who's not as familiar with this methodology, once you gather then for each one of these cells, you're going to have a file that will have the size, the complexity of the cell population. Here we have, um, no, it's not there, sorry. So we have uh, size and complexity, and then the fluorescence intensity for each of the markers, whether it's three markers or whether it's 28 markers, you'll have that information for every single cell. That's stored in the computer, and then we analyze it uh, using a variety of methods, which I'll discuss in the coming slides. Uh, flow cytometry has been a tool that I've used my entire career. Um, ever since I started my graduate work at National Jewish Hospital in Denver, I worked with John Cambier, on B cell signaling and B cell activation using the flow cytometry. And from that point on, I was hooked. Uh, and from there, I went to DNAC's Research Institute uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Palo Alto, where I continued to use this tool for studying TH1, TH2 development. And in fact, in my, uh, in my PhD thesis, I started on B cell uh, activation as an undergraduate student with John Cambier. And then I went on to study T cell tolerance and superantigens. Uh, with Ed Palmer, where really flow cytometry made possible uh, the ability to follow specific T cell populations of tolerance and deletion uh, during, during my PhD. So once I arrived at DNAX and met uh, Len Herzenberg and, and Lee Herzenberg at Stanford uh, in the early 90s, I continued to intensify uh, uh, our work and we spent a sabbatical about a year and a half in, in their laboratory as well, where we learned many uh, important advances in the area. Len uh, was awarded the Kyoto Prize for Medical Technology in 2006. And this basic design is very similar to the flow cytometers today, uh, several decades later. So as I mentioned, we have the Fact Symphony A5 and we have the uh, the, the fax area cell sorter. This is for purifying cell populations and this uh, for, for analyzing cell populations using many different parameters. And so to give you an idea of the number of markers and parameters that we're interested in looking at, I see I, I have a little bit of mixed Portuguese uh, and English on this slide still. Um, but basically we, we have designed panels together with uh, Bob Barderas and Rodrigo from BD uh, that are compatible with our machine and allow us to decipher many different aspects 
ranging from activation markers uh, in different T cell populations. Uh, again, we are interested in many different T cell populations, NK cells, memory cells, and then you have functional potential that we can study via the production, for example, of cytolytic mo molecules like granzyme, proliferation, and bioactive cytokines like inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha interferon gamma or inhibitory cytokines like IL-10. We can study Th1, Th2 subpopulations, Th17 populations, follicular cells, and exhaustion based on expression of different markers. And we also have hybrid panels that we've made where we can look at both monocytes, macrophages, and many other, uh, and many other different uh, criteria. The, so, so for whoever was on uh, the, this is, I'm on the Facebook Live here. It looks like whoever is on the, uh, the other platform, my cell phone has overheated. And the message just came on uh, saying that it has overheated and it shut off. So unfortunately, whoever was on the other Instagram, uh, uh, whoever was on the Instagram, please switch over while you're not hearing me. <laughs> I guess they'll see it goes off and they'll go over to Facebook. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, it has, it says, I've never seen this before. It's overheated and it is off for now. So if it comes back on, I'll, I'll put that back on. Sorry about that. So the, the hybrid uh, panel allows us to look, look both at monocyte macrophage aspects as well as T cell aspects and cytokines. And then we have panels focused solely on the myeloid compartment of the, of the immune response. So when I mentioned that we have five lasers in 28 colors, uh, many of you who have worked a lot with flow cytometry think, wow, that's gonna be a nightmare when it comes to compensation, when it comes to being able to limit spectral overlap. Um, this is what spectral overlap is a situation where light from one of these fluorochromes and one of these molecules will bleed over into another detector. Um, we have ways of trying to uh, subtract out this type of spectral overlap when you have light from one bleeding into another. And we also can have many different ways to deal with that. But just to give you an idea here of a panel, this is courtesy of, of, of Paul Barberis from BD. Um, we have a multicolor panel uh, set up with several different markers off the UV laser, several markers off the violet, several off the blue, yellow, green, and the red. And one of the key uh, uh, processes that we have to go through when we're setting up our panels is to deal with the adjustment of the machine. And the, the fact symphony, um, we, we perform what's called a voltration panel. And so what we do in this situation is every single one of the dyes are conjugated to an anti-CD4 antibody, the same anti-CD4 antibody. And then we stain uh, CD4 PBMCs or whole blood and once these cells are stained, you have the same antibody against CD4 with this fluorochrome, with this fluorochrome, and so on, all the way down to all 28 fluorochromes. And then you create what's called a spread matrix, which shows us the areas where we're going to have problems with, um, with spectral overlap, where you have light from one entering into the other, and other areas where there's very little problem with spectral overlap. So you can see that there are many different areas that are white or light pink, where it's very little overlap between one antibody and the other based on the fluorochromes. So here we have uh, BUV737 uh, creating an overlap with the detector for UV820. Uh, so we have light from BUV737 entering into the detector of UV820. This is like a false positive. You can think of it like that. So this light is entered into this detector. And what we do is we subtract that light out. But to avoid that, to avoid these areas where we have a lot of spectral overlap, overlap, we just avoid this being a problem in our panel design. So you can put either markers that are less intense onto these sorts of uh, areas, or you can also try to choose antibodies that will not be expressed by the same population that's expressing your antibody uh, stained with one of these other markers like BUV805. 
So when you're designing your panel, you, you take advantage of this information before designing it and choose these areas that are white to have the, uh, uh, to limit the amount of spectral overlap you have to deal with when you're analyzing. Now, to make that a little clear, let me just check here and see if the cell phone has come back. Okay, it's coming back on. Sorry, let me take a second to get people who are on uh, Instagram back on. Reconnecting. Let's see. It still says reconnecting, okay. Yeah, if that happens to come back on, uh, I guess it'll just show up. So um, the spectral, uh, that, that spectral overlap that I'm talking about can be seen in this way. Um, so we run the voltration with every single one of our uh, fluorochromes. And this here is just one slide for BUV661. So this is one of the fluorochromes off of our UV laser. And we look at that marker against every other fluorochrome that we have in our panel. So here we're seeing on the x-axis, the BUV661. And on the y-axis, we have BUV395, 496, et cetera. And you can see here that, again, this staining should only be positive in this x direction because it's BUV661. And when we see a problem with spectral overlap or spreading, you can see a spreading of this population into the BUV737, for example. You can see a spreading down here into the red APC. And you can see a spreading in some other detectors. So what we want to do when we're designing our, our panels is to avoid uh, crossover between markers in BUV737, either on the same population or one that would create any sort of problem for us. Uh, these are very clean uh, stainings where we have very little spectral overlap. So this allows us to design a powerful uh, panel that limits any of this sort of spectral overlap, and um, and that will that will let us that will let us uh, stay. Uh, sorry, I, this is this is complicated with having the uh, the. the Instagram feed die. And I will just try to get that back up here. Okay, that's back on. All right, sorry people on Instagram, uh, cell phone overheated and shut off, never had that happen, but uh, it's back on. If you can go over to Facebook, it'll be, uh, it'll be safer, I think, okay. All right, so um, this, this allows us then to design panels where we're limiting any spectral overlap and having the cleanest possible combination of markers. That allows us to get up to 26, uh, even up to 28 markers uh, in a single uh, assay. So when it comes to analyzing these different cell populations, um, we have many different ways of analyzing flow cytometry data. This is the basic directed analysis where we know that we're interested in studying uh, CD8 positive PD1 expressing cells and CD4 positive PD uh, PD-1 expressing cells. And in that case, we're gating on lymphocytes, then you can gate on CD4 positive cells. Then from the CD4, you can go and look at the expression of CD4 and PD-1. This is a directed analysis. We're also interested in knowing about naive central memory and effector memory cells. So we can gate on the populations and look at these different uh, populations that we want to know about. And another example here, looking at monocytes, we can look at classical, non-classical, and intermediate monocytes. So this is what we call directed analysis. It's very powerful when we have cells that we know we're interested in. Another type of uh, one step up in complexity is using uh, multi-marker detection. And so here, what we're doing in, in Flojo is detecting functionally distinct T-cell subsets using three different parameters, but only in two, uh, in a two-dimensional graph. So we have CD56, and CD69 activation marker, uh, CD69. And you can see that when we have uh, CD56 or CD69 single positives and double positives, and then here in the color, we're adding the expression of CD107A. So this is an indicator of cytolytic potential as our third parameter. 
And you can see as it's more red, it means there's more of that marker. And when it's blue, there's very little. So on these graphs, we can also look and see that here on this graph, it's a little easier to see. We have cells that are CD56, CD69 negative that have very little expression of CD107A. And then we have double positives and CD69 positives that are expressed in more of this third marker, CD107. This is still a directed analysis, and it brings us, though, more capacity to understand what's going on. Now, a more recent uh, 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 analysis methodology that's being used for flow cytometry data for the high dimensional flow cytometry sets is based on unsupervised machine learning. And this really allows us to take those dozens and dozens of different markers and reduce them down to manageable, manageable dimensions. So um, in this particular panel, we have many different markers. You don't need to worry about all the different markers at this point. And these, uh, this, this unsupervised machine learning methodology, uh, it's, it's called TISNI, which is Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding. What that does then is takes each one of these different cells with all the different markers that are available, and it goes clustering those together into, uh, into groups that form these different clusters based on the similarity of expression of different markers. So let's take through here to show, to show what's happened. Again, this is unsupervised machine learning. So we have all these different markers and all the different possible combinations of these markers present. We take many different cell uh, populations and samples. We put them together, join them together, and run this Disney analysis. We'll then divide the data based on these two different new criteria, and they will segregate each event based on these distribution events. And so here what we see is CD45, for example, is expressed by all the cells in the sample, but these are uh, uh, human, human blood cells, so we expect them all to express CD45. Now we have higher intensities uh, of expression to a little lower intensities of expression. And then we go and look and see what are these different clusters. So this cluster here is expressing CD3, and this cluster over here is also expressing CD3. And you can see that we have many different subclusters in each of these as well, which will be different segregations based on different markers within this population. So if we ask, okay, so what, what cells are these? And we click and we come over here to this diagram, you can see that these are CD4 positive T cells. And what are these cells here? We come down here and they are CD8 positive T cells. So using unsupervised machine learning, the algorithm has segregated these different, all the different cell populations into a CD3 expressing cells that cluster together, but these two are different from one another. And why are they different? Because this cluster was expressing CD4 and this cluster here is expressing CD8. And then you can say, hey, there's a population there that's kind of low for CD4. You know, what, what is that all about? So these cells, they're negative for CD3. And we know that in humans, uh, monocytes can express CD4. So these could be uh, uh, low expressing CD4 positive monocytes. So uh, a monocyte marker is CD14. So we go looking over here and here's CD14. And yes, indeed, those cells are also positive for CD14. So this CD4 here is expressing at a lower level on the CD14 positive monocytes. And these cells are the CD4 high, which are the T cells. So this is just to really give you a quick idea as to the power of TISNI. And what this can help you do is identify populations that you didn't expect. So I expect to look at PD-1 positive CD8 cells or CD4 cells with CD69, for example, but I don't necessarily know that they're gonna be um, important in my different disease settings. And there could be other populations that I didn't think about looking that TISNI will decipher out between two different groups. So this is just a sample. Uh, to help exemplify the power of this methodology. This is with three patients that responded to anti-PD-1 therapy and two patients that did not respond to anti-PD-1 therapy. We're running a small panel in this assay of some T cell markers. And this is again, the clustering of all those five different samples together. And you create a, a mess of clusters and then you separate them out into each individual patient. So this is a patient one, two, and three who, res who responded, and patients one and two who didn't respond. And looking at these, you can already immediately see that there's a population that's missing from the non-responders and present in the responders. So this, this sort of methodology then lets you gate on that population 
Here's the two non-responders, the three responders, and you can see again that this population is missing from the, from the non-responders. Then you can go back and find out what markers are present there and what they uh, may tell you about the responding patients. So the study that I wanna show you some data uh, for today is uh, based on melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer patients treated with immunotherapy. Uh, lung cancer is a major problem in Brazil. Um, it comes in with around almost 9% of all cancers in men and 6% of all cancers in women. And melanoma is a very serious uh, uh, metastatic disease that can be metastatic in uh, up, up to 1.4% of the patient of, of the cancers in, in uh, men and 1.6% in women. So both very important cancers. And why do we focus on these in this case is because uh, atlasecomargo patients with these cancers are treated as first line therapy with uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So in the, in the experimental design that I'm gonna show you now, um, we really wanted to study patients that had first line therapy with these checkpoint inhibitors. They have not been submitted to other therapy ahead of time. So the immune response that we are able to look at before therapy begins has not suffered the effects of chemotherapy or other cancer treatments. And since it's used as first therapy in non-small cell lung cancer and first-line therapy in melanoma, these were two very good groups for us to study uh, in this context. So the non-small cell lung cancer patients are treated with anti-PD-1 plus chemotherapy together. And the melanoma patients, the great majority, are anti-PD-1 plus anti-CTLA-4. We have some groups that are just treated with anti-PD-1, but the majority are combination therapy today. So what we did here at time zero before the treatment began, uh, we take a sample of uh, peripheral blood and also a uh, tumor biopsy. This tumor um, biopsy is then disassociated and frozen. We're using that for future analysis. And then over time, we follow this cohort of patients at uh, zero weeks, three weeks, nine weeks, 27 weeks, we take new blood draws to follow the progression of the immune response during treatment as it relates to response to therapy and also development of these autoimmune adverse events. So we have some people that will respond, some that won't respond, and some that will develop autoimmune reactions. So what I'm focusing on today is the high dimensional flow cytometry uh, information from this uh, patient cohort. <clears throat> so in the non-small cell lung cancer group, uh, looking at responder versus non-responders at 27 weeks, we saw that we have 10 what we call non-responders with progressive disease and 15 responders, which either have stable disease or a partial response. We didn't have any complete response to date in this cohort. Um, these patients were a mixture of male and female and different metastasy locations that were not significantly different between the two groups. So we use a series of, pan of, of markers for T cell populations, activation, as I mentioned earlier, CD69, CD107A, which is a cytolytic activation uh, marker, uh, exhaustion indicators, uh, PD-1 and CTLA-4, as well as B cell monocyte populations, but I'm going to focus just on the T cell response today. And so the basic uh, protocol then is to run these cells through the, the fact symphony, uh, perform the, the directed analysis and also the TISNI analysis, and then relate that back to whether the people were responders or non-responders, again, at time zero, so we can try and identify a peripheral marker that will predict who will or who won't respond to therapy. So when this analysis was run, um, this is uh, work done by Amanda, who's a postdoc in the lab with FAPESPI. And what you can see here on the left-hand side is the non-responder patients uh, and the TISNI uh, uh, highlighting the different subgroups produced in the non-responder group and the TISNI showing the different subgroups produced in the responder group. And you can see that there's one particular group here that's highlighted uh, that's present in the responder and absent from the non-responder. When you go look at that population and see what it is, we can see that those are activated CD4 positive T cells present in responder and absent in the non-responder. Again, this is in the peripheral blood at time zero before the patient has started treatment. Now this TISNI lets you know that there's a difference, but it doesn't perform a statistical analysis on each individual, right? This is based on clustering 
and machine learning to define these different subpopulations. So when you've identified a population of interest, you can go back and look at the exact markers that were used for defining the population and perform a standard directed analysis. So here uh, is, our, is our standard bar graphs, looking then at total CD4 positive T cells, which was a population that was segregated uh, with some overlap with the responders, but mostly a non-responder. And here's that population that's clearly in the responder and very little in the non-responder. And when we analyze that based on CD4 positive T cells, uh, taking singlets and CD4 positive, CD3 positive, uh, CD69 positive cells, we see that the responder patients had higher levels as a group of those cells in their blood before they started treatment. So this is a potential predictor of who will respond to therapy. Now, when you take that and run an area under the curve analysis, a rock analysis, you can see that the activated T cells had a uh, fairly strong predictive capacity for sensitivity and specificity of 0.74 and a strong P value of, of uh, uh, less than 0.01. And the CD4 population did not uh, resolve a statistically significant uh, 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 analysis for specificity and sensitivity. And then so taking these activated cells and asking ourselves, what about their ability to predict survival? Uh, Amanda ran a uh, survival analysis, again, looking at patients that had the higher uh, levels of activated CD4 positive T cells, even patients with lower levels of CD4 uh, activated T cells. And you can see that we had a statistically significant, uh, sorry, <laughs> we, had a, we had a separation of these groups um, at 0.06. Uh, based on this survival uh, uh, analysis, where we have a medium survival of 102 days for the low uh, expressors of, of activated cells and a medium survival of 277 days for the higher expression of the same, uh, the same marker. So these studies are still underway. We're going to have uh, 40 patients in the group, uh, and today we're doing a partial analysis at this point. So we'll see if this uh, becomes stronger or weaker as time goes on. Um, so I'm going to wrap up um, now just talking a little bit about adverse events in immunotherapy because of the time, and I want to leave some time for questions. So just to remind you, the other aspect of this work was to look at uh, markers that will predict this formation of adverse events. Again, adverse events are very important in immunotherapy checkpoint, uh, at, uh, in checkpoint immunotherapy because when you have people that respond well, you can also have this production of an inflammatory response that leads to a collateral effect uh, in the sense of autoimmune uh, reactions. So we want to try to identify immune components that are responsible for these adverse events, these autoimmune reactions, and see if we can distinguish them from the response that's specific for the tumor. Um, again, due to the time today, I think I'm going to stop here on this slide. Um, and I'll skip through to the acknowledgements, but just to remind you that we did a series of analysis similar to the ones I just showed you, uh, designed to identify cell populations that are responsible for these, that are indica indicative of the uh, adverse events. So uh, in, in the end, uh, in summary, um, we've been able then to identify that in those patients that uh, do or don't respond to immunotherapy, we were able to identify that activated uh, peripheral blood CD4 positive T cells were predictor of a, of a responder group and non-activated CD4 positive T cells seem to be more predictive of non-responder non patients. And we saw that higher CD8 positive T cells uh, predicted future adverse events. And I had to skip through those data because of the time um, but we can, uh, of course, address any questions about that in the, in the question answer uh, uh, period. Uh, briefly, I'd like to uh, highlight Applied Cancer Research, which is a, um, a journal that's with BMC. Uh, Applied Cancer, Cancer Research uh, publishes all sorts of uh, data related to uh, cancer research, ranging from treatments to preventative care, diagnostics, and uh, the cost of publication of accepted manuscripts is currently being covered by a grant from a second article. 
And so please feel free to uh, check out the site and submit uh, interesting uh, manuscripts to that uh, journal. Um, and so acknowledging the, all the collaborators at, at a second Margo, this is really a, a multidisciplinary project involving clinicians uh, from all areas of the hospital and also researchers from the research center, the immuno-oncology group, uh, uh, as I mentioned, all the different students, technicians, and postdocs involved in those studies, Institute of Maidapena, where we're carrying out the cervical cancer studies that are financed by our Pronome uh, project, and Val Dutra at OFMJ, Georgia Trinqueri at NCI, and Andrea Teixeira from Fiocruz are key collaborators in these projects. And we have funding uh, from the National Institutes of Health, from NCI, uh, CMPK, FAPESB, uh, the uh, ENCT in cancer, which is uh, headed up by Vilma Martins at the SEC Margo. So thanks a lot. Um, let me uh, leave here and uh, I can address any, any questions that people, that people may have. The Instagram, I'm gonna try to get the Instagram back up here. And uh, I think the best way is going to be to delete it and try it again. Okay. So yeah, the the sorry about that Instagram people. Um, it was uh, constantly overheating the cell phone. As I mentioned, these things seem to only happen uh, for the first time ever in an event like this. Never had that problem, uh, but. Sorry about that, it did uh, overheat and shut off. Um, but we are uh, back on here. So I'll stop the sharing there. I'm back here uh, on, on the video and we can address uh, questions that, that, uh, that we may have. Okay, so I'll have to uh, I'm sorry people I am having lots of trouble with the uh, uh, with the interface here the dual interface of Instagram and uh, Facebook so due to that I think I will uh, thank everybody for their uh, for their presence today. Uh, if I'm going to just see if I can get on to another interface here to see if we have, uh, see if we have questions. All right. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm not able to figure this out. So let me just uh, let me just wrap up. I hope that that was a, a, a helpful uh, presentation for you all. Sorry again about the technical technical issues. Hope that wasn't too distracting. Um, our our basic uh, premise is that the peripheral blood immune response will be indicative of uh, markers that can predict our our eventual response to an immunotherapy. Again, that can be either response to anti-PD-1 or anti-CTLA-4. And in addition, we'll be able to identify uh, markers that can identify which individuals will develop uh, an adverse event or uh, uh, autoimmune disease. And again, the goal here is to be able to segregate these populations uh, via their phenotype and the different uh, functional characteristics, as well as their expression of their T-cell receptor CDR3 region. So we're performing uh, some new studies in the future, in the, in the, in the soon future, using a single cell RNA-seq analysis. That analysis takes advantage of taking single cell uh, RNA sequencing together with the T cell receptor CDR3 region and identifying the specificity of those different uh, populations. So, so that, uh, that is uh, something that, that we are going to be uh, uh, doing in the near future.
Yeah, that doesn't show up for me. Okay, um, so yeah, we do have a we have a question here about uh, the role of macrophages uh, in immunosuppression. Um, yeah, so that uh, that myeloid panel that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that panel is really focused on uh, dissecting the role of macrophage subpopulations, either M1 or M2 macrophages. Uh, and also fibroblast subpopulations can have an important role in driving suppressive or more inflammatory immune responses. And so we have specific panels for identifying those uh, in the peripheral blood and in the tissue um, where we'll also be analyzing these different uh, aspects using, uh, using a different uh, variety of, of methodologies. Um, for the for the for the tissue, we which is shown here on this slide, um, we'll be looking at the local tumor immune response using uh, multiplex uh, staining with multiplex fluorescence, a spatial transcriptome profile, which is a really uh, interesting approach. You can see on 10x's uh, genome system um, that allows you to do a spatial uh, transcriptome in tissues, looking at uh, uh, the organization of in the in the context of the three-dimensional uh, aspects of the of the tissue, uh, exome and HLA typing, and then the the single cell RNA seq allows us then to look at different T cell populations, for example, with their T cell receptor usage, in combination with knowing the activation profile of that given T cell population. So this uh, will be done with the BD wraps to the single cell system. Uh, which we'll have set up in the lab in a couple months and be running those assays. And that'll allow us to drill down on those specific pop subpopulations and really, uh, really help us understand more about what, uh, what's going on there. So, oh, it, I think, Stop share. Okay, so thank you all very much. Uh, we're just a couple minutes away here from the the end of the webinar. Again, I'd like to thank uh, SBE, the uh, Sociedade Brasileira de Immunologia, uh, and the uh, BD Biosciences for for sponsoring these uh, seminar series. Again, I think it's a great opportunity to be able to share uh, some of our work and some of our experience. Feel free to get in touch with me, anybody via via my email. You can find that online at the Secamargo's uh, site, and I'd be happy to uh, discuss more with any of you. Uh, any any uh, other questions you may have? Uh, thanks again. Up uh, one. Could you talk a little bit about the association between CD48 cells and the adverse effects of the immune therapy from this? Yeah. So there's one more question about the CD8. Uh, uh, the finding that we had on CD8 activated C T cells and adverse events in immunotherapy. Um, this was a <clears throat> this is a very interesting finding uh, in the sense that it's really the same population as a whole that we expect to be associated with response to therapy, right? So when we have a activated CD8 positive T cell that is going to be rescued by immunotherapy. We want to see reactivation of cells against the tumor, which we have when we have somebody that responds to the immunotherapy to combat the tumor. But when you get along with that uh, reactivation of CD8 T cells that are autoreactive, that's where we have a problem. Um, now we know that the two run together. So there are other studies already published showing that you have a higher incidence of, of adverse events in people that respond to therapy. So as we get a better response, we will see some increase as well in adverse events. And what our study really wants to do, that's really the key of what we wanna be able to find out, is which CD8 T cells are those that are causing the autoimmune response and which CD8 T cells are those that are responding against the tumor. So that's where we're gonna go down into the TCR, CDR3 region usage, HLA, neoantigen prediction, and try and identify those cells that are involved in responding to the tumor and those that are causing the autoimmune disease, and then see if we can intervene and inhibit 
those cells that are causing autoimmune disease while permitting the cells that will respond against the tumor. So thanks a lot for that question. Um, that's really a key uh, point of these studies. And uh, I, again, I look forward to discussing with any of you in the future uh, more details about this work. And we'll have a few uh, publications coming out uh, in this area once we uh, finish writing them and get them uh, submitted. Uh, one of the aspects of the pandemic is we've had time to analyze lots of data sets. And again, some of these, we wanna expand the data set uh, to include more patients still. And we've now started re-enrolling patients, which we had stopped for several months because of the COVID pandemic uh, to allow the hospital to really focus on taking care of the, uh, of the, of the situation with the COVID-19 pandemic and create a very safe environment for the cancer patients at the hospital. And that was a, a great success. And now we're able to uh, restart these, uh, these studies and rolling patients again. All right, thanks again uh, for the opportunity and uh, have, a, have a great afternoon, everybody.